Welcome to Mare Cycles and Foaling Basics. I'm Jeff Tucker. Everyone knows me as Doc T. And this is a presentation of my horse talk series on the Horses Advocate. Horses Advocate is a website and is part of the equine practice. You reach it at thehorsesadvocate.com. Don't forget the word the. I'm a veterinarian who's been around for a while and I love to teach horse owners to become an advocate for their horse living in a human world. And I love to simplify the fundamentals because I believe knowledge is power. So I put this together on a worldwide webcast because I like to get into these discussions a little bit deeper and I like to put it in a place where people can see it and have it forever. And that's what happens if you become a subscriber at the Horse's Advocate. So why talk about mare cycles and foaling basics? Well, this is basic, <laughs> basically, everything's basic here at the equine practice, but this, this whole webinar is gonna be divided into two separate webinars. The first is all about the mare's cycle, and the second is gonna be on the foaling basics. Because I, if you understand both of those, then you've got the, the cornerstones or the foundation to build yourself a really good reproductive um, program at your farm. But I want to go over one really important thing. I'm not here to discuss the unwanted horse population. The total number of horses in the United States has dropped from about 10 million horses down to about 6.5 million horses in the past decade. This is huge. The number of horses that are being bred is being reduced. But I want you to also keep in mind that this is a worldwide web broadcast. And the top care is relevant to parts of the world where about 100 million horses, asses, and mules are an integral part of the family. So my only objective here is for anyone breeding horses to have good information on how to do it. I am not judging people. I'm here to help horses thrive in a human world. So please understand this as we dive in and try to make breeding very easy and understandable for everybody. First, if you don't know this, I've been a horseman since 1973 and a horse veterinarian since 1984. So many of the horses uh, that I see um, come from an old way of taking care of them that has not changed. Their cycles haven't changed. The delivery of foal hasn't changed. And so I love to tell um, my experiences and stories and through photography and here today through Worldwide Webcast. So that's me and let's move on. Part one, <clears throat> the cycle of the mare. We're gonna talk about the basic parts of the cycle, what changes occur in the cycle throughout the year, how can we see these cycle parts, how do we record these observations, how do we interpret these observations, and when do we breed? We'll go over the, each one of these parts so you don't have to write all those down. And the second part is gonna be about delivering the foal. <clears throat> how to prepare the delivering area, what to have on hand uh, to watch or not to watch the foaling process, what is elbow lock, what is a red sack delivery, when to call for help, and what to do within the first 24 hours. Okay, so grab onto your uh, pen and paper and a cup of coffee because we may go a little bit fast here because there's a lot to cover in an hour-long webinar. Okay, the cycle of the mare. Here is a picture of a mare winking, and I want you to understand this. The tail is up in the air, the um, vulva lips are everted out, and you can see the insides of a reproductive tract or the start of a reproductive tract right there. And that part is called the clitoris. And in this particular mare, she has a caslex operation, which I'm not going to go into. That's a picture of the vulva that's been stitched closed to make sure that the feces that comes out does not get in, inside the uh, reproductive tract, which is a, a problem some of these mares are trying to keep them fertile. But again, this <clears throat> whole thing is not about uh, the intricacies. Uh, you need to couple yourself with a veterinarian to work over the details. Here it is, just the basic parts. So the first thing is that a mare is uh, seasonally polyesterous, which means the horse starts to cycle when the length of daylight increases and stops cycling with a decrease in daylight. Now this is different depending on where you are. If you're in the southern hemisphere of the, of the globe, <clears throat> the uh, shortest daylight is in June and the longest daylight is in December. Whereas up here in America, uh, the shortest is December and the longest is uh, in June. 
And of course, if you're at the equator, it's a little bit more steady state. There are two parts of the heat cycle called estrus and diestrus. Estrus is where the mare is in heat, and on average, for six days, she's receptive to being bred. When she is out of heat, that's the time when she is not being receptive, and that's an average of 15 days. 15 and 6 makes 21, and 21 days is the whole cycle of the mare. In estrus, <clears throat> it starts and stops abruptly, and in others, it's a very subtle and very barely perceptible event. Overt signs are the mare seeks out the stallion. Now, this is an important concept. The stallion does not go around knocking on the mare's door. It's the mare seeks out the stallion. That's what happens in real life. They stand for teasing and breeding if you're in the barn. You can bring a stallion up to the mare, and she'll uh, bend her legs. They'll lift their tail, and they'll avert the uh, clitoris called winking, as you see here. And this also happens when they urinate, so don't be confused. The mare often releases a small amount of urine as she postures by lowering the pelvis in a partially, partial squat, raises her tail, winks the clitoris while backing into the stallion, or in some cases, any other object, including other mares. If estrus was observed in every mare, we would not have, be having this discussion. The problem is it doesn't always um, show obvious signs. And by the way, if you're in Great Britain, I'm sorry if I'm spelling estrus wrong. This is how we spell it in America. Uh, anyway, during this time, the follicles that hold the maturing eggs become enlarged and release estrogen, which is a hormone causing this kind of behavior. And towards the end of the six-day cycle, one or more follicles rupture, releasing the egg or multiple eggs that stop the production of estrogen and start the formation of a blood clot called the corpora hemorrhagicum, or the CH. And it causes a rise in progesterone, which brings the mare out of heat. So just to repeat this, the follicle starts to grow. It creates estrogen. The mare gets in heat. The mare ovulates, which means releases the egg. The uh, remaining uh, spot turns into a blood clot, and that starts forming the progesterone, which brings the mare out of heat. And it takes usually about six days. In the diesterous phase, there are no maturing follicles. In other words, the ovaries are very quiet. The corpora hemorrhagicum becomes a corpus luteum, or CL. It's called that because luteum is yellow, and they call it the yellow body. Um, and that's the thing that produces the hormone progesterone, which keeps the mare from being bred, as well as starts the maintenance of the presumed pregnancy. Some mares can show receptivity to the stallion during this time, but usually she shows behavior clearly indicating she's not interested in breeding. She stays away from the stallion. She squeals. She kicks. She basically says, get out of my house. If there's no pregnancy, then there's no continuation of the CL, and the progesterone levels fall, followed by an increasing uh, rise in estrogen and the formation of follicles follicles, and the mare starts cycling, comes back into heat. Now, this is a regular period. Now, if the mare had become pregnant, the pregnancy itself would continue the progesterone and prevent the ovaries from creating more follicles, and she'd be out of heat and basically pregnant. But also, there's a period called anestrus. So we have estrus and diestrus. And then we have anestrus, and this is when the mare stops cycling during the winter. The reason for this is to ensure that when the mare does deliver a foal, there's plenty of grass available to eat. So we don't want the foal dropping in, in November in North America. When winter is coming, there's very little food. We want the mare to develop a foal um, to drop in the springtime. Now, the mare's gestation period is 11 months. <clears throat> so if you breed her in, let's say, April, She'll drop a foal in March, and then she'll <clears throat> wait about a month to get inbred again, and then she'll be dropping a foal again in March. So it's a kind of handy cycle of one uh, foal per year. So it's controlled by the pineal gland and the pituitary. And it is that gland that recognizes increasing, decreasing daylight. It also increases, um, recognizes the daylight that triggers shedding of the hair coat in the springtime and the development of a hair coat in the winter. 
And older horses that have difficulty shedding their hair coat have a, a small hypertrophy or, or tumor of this pineal gland. Mares are usually indifferent to stallions during this time of year and are unable to conceive until they start to cycle again in the spring. I want to talk about how important it is to have records. Recording the cycle of the mare is the foundation to any breeding program because every mare cycles differently, but it's based on the same basics. So in other words, how a mare shows estrus is infinitely variable, and records help to show a pattern in particular mares whose receptive period may be only hours long. I told you that it's usually six days, but some mares are absolutely no go except for maybe six, eight, ten hours in their whole 21 day cycle. And with good records, you'll be able to find this and you'll know that this particular mare has a very short estrus period where you have to get her covered and, and bred. Also, mares with long estrus periods can be exhausting to some stallions. Knowing when a mare is about to ovulate or release the egg from the follicle helps to manage the stallion. So in other words, if a mare is in heat for 10 days, and yet the only time that that mare can get pregnant is on the day of ovulation, which is the last day of estrus, then breeding her on the first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth days is just an exercise in futility because the mare is not going to get pregnant on that because the stallion's uh, semen cannot last more than 24 hours, maybe tops 48 hours in the mare. So start with labeling the record with the mare's information, including her breeding history and foaling history. There's no information off limits, including age, sex, breed, and color, identifying marks, uh, even a picture of her to make sure that you know which mare you're talking about if you have many mares on your farm. And record the observation date and all your observations of the mare's behavior. Now it can be simple as O for out of heat and I for in heat. But when you do that in heat, um, you should make a, a particular note of she started to raise her tail or she seemed more mellow today or anything that indicates that she's changing her mood. Teasing the mare by bringing her to the stallion is the best way to look for signs of estrus, but many farms don't have access to a stallion. So you have to be paying particular attention how playful she is, how uh, subtle, how more manageable she is. Anything, write it down because careful observations of the mare behavior may indicate her cycle better than anything else. Subtle behavior can be her appetite, her ease or lack of ease under saddle, or when being groomed, swishing the tail differently, occasionally lifting of the tail, winking not associated with normal urination, and other things. Anything is um, reasonable to write down. And because the more careful you look, the more subtle signs you'll see. Record them all and assign your conclusions in heat, not in heat, coming into heat, and going out of heat. Remember, sometimes it's a case of um, instant change, and in others it can be a very slow change, especially during the springtime. And I didn't actually talk about this, but um, sometimes between December 21st and June 21st, and it doesn't matter which side of the equator you're on, we have that midpoint where you have equal daylight. Um, it's usually September 21st or March 21st. And that's when they go into what we call a transitional heat. And transitional heats are important because they can be confusing to people. In other words, they're kind of wishy-washy. They're, oh, maybe she's in heat, maybe she's not. Oh, yeah, she's in heat. You bring her to the stallion, she says no. Um, so you have to be careful with these because they're not really strong heats. And if they're not strong heats, there's a good chance that the follicle actually won't ovulate. And if they don't ovulate, then the mare is never going to get pregnant. You must have an ovulation to have the mare get pregnant. So do this for every mare, no matter how obvious the signs are. Things could change next year, especially with a mare having a full by her side. In other words, you may have a year where everything goes like clockwork and you can breed them, everything's perfect. The following year, when your mares have foals by their side, all rules have changed. And now the mare is not going to show signs of estrus as long as she's protecting the foal. She may even shut down for the year and say, forget about it. Or as soon as she foals within four or five days, she's saying, I want to get pregnant again. You must be prepared for all this, and records are everything in the success of your breeding program. I can't emphasize that enough. 
Speaking of which, uh, the foal heat. Mares that deliver foals will come back in the heat in as little as six days, but on average nine days after foaling. So, it, and this is called the foal heat. If the mare had an uncomplicated birth, then she can be very receptive, and this is a perfect time to breed your horse. If the mare had any complications, then allowing her to go through a cycle before breeding is usually advised, although the rate of conception may be less. It sounds, um, especially to women, you don't want to just constantly have babies. But in the real world of reproduction, both in humans and in horses, if the, the equipment sorry, is constantly being used for the purpose it was designed for, it has a better chance of continuing that purpose. It's when you don't use the equipment that it atrophies, and with atrophy, you have a, a decreased chance of actually uh, conceiving. So let's look at some tricks to breeding. Know the variables by keeping accurate observation records. Cover the mare within 12 hours before ovulation. Before that or after ovulation, the chances of conception fall quickly to nothing. There is an exception to this, and that is if you're using frozen semen, and that's a whole different discussion. We're talking about natural live cover here. So the mare will um, be the most, have the greatest chance of conception if you have her covered within 12 hours before ovulation. You can also force a mare to cycle early in the season if you keep a 100 watt incandescent light, not a fluorescent, but an incandescent, the old screw and light bulbs uh, with a filament in there. Um, and couple that with daylight for a total of 16 hours starting about one month before the shortest day of the year. So our rule of thumb is uh, a, little time, a little bit after Thanksgiving here in North America, it's a national holiday in the United States. You turn the light bulb on and you make sure that it's on early in the morning and late in the day. So you have a total of 16 hours. And by January 1st, usually these mares start to cycle. Now horses near the equator may cycle throughout the year. Here's another thing. Mares are supposed to lose weight over the winter. And as the daylight increases, so does their weight because you have more grass out there, more food available. And these mares that are underweight in the winter and gaining weight in the spring have a better conception rate than mares that are kept fat all winter. Please keep your mares on the thin side during the winter and, and let them start to gain weight in the spring and you will see them become pregnant easier. In addition, don't let them get fat because fat mares have more problems delivering their foals than lean mares. It's just a fact of life. So, all overfed mares can pass the extra nutrition on to their foals in utero, causing developmental growth problems such as osteochondrosis desiccans, epiphysitis, contracted tendons. All these problems that we see in mares, uh, pardon me, in foals, can be caused by you feeding these horses grain throughout the year and getting them overweight. So I please, I'm, I can't emphasize this enough. Try not to overfeed your horses, uh, especially the mares, if you want to have a really good reproductive program. So that's all I've got about breeding, uh, or the cycle of the mare, I should say. There's such, there, people become board certified in reproduction. Uh, certainly a, a veterinarian who spends her life with um, breeding mares uh, has tons of information, valuable experience to learn from. But I will guarantee you there's not one veterinarian or a manager of breeding stock that doesn't do the record keeping. I can't emphasize that more than that. You must keep records and maintain your mare on a good level plane of nutrition that slightly increases in the springtime and decreases over the winter. And those two things alone will increase your chances of having a really good, successful reproductive um, uh, event on your farm. So now I want to move into delivering the foal. And delivering the foal is one of my favorites. Now most of you who know me uh, know that all I do is dentistry now. And I do the horsemanship style dentistry. And you can uh, see that at horsemanshipdentistry.com. And there's a secret out there. I love delivering foals. Um, there's a time in my life where I had not gone to college. I decided to work on a thoroughbred breeding and training farm. 
And part of my duties uh, and as the assistant farm manager was to attend all foalings. So I was able to attend and also assist, I mean, pull out foals from mares that were stuck before I ever went back to um, undergraduate school at Cornell and move on to being a veterinarian from Cornell. So there's a ton of experience I had on these things, and I absolutely loved the foaling. I had no problem leaving my house, my warm bed at 3 o'clock in the morning and driving through snow to help a mare deliver that was stuck. It was just that much fun for me. But I'm going to convey to you some of the important aspects that you need to know. So when you do have, your mayor do, does have her foal, uh, it's going to be a successful event. And I'd like to thank um, a f veterinarian friend of mine, uh, Dr. Tonya Hedrick in Jupiter, Florida, who uh, gave me permission to use these pictures of her uh, donkey being de delivered, her donkey foal. And that's the pictures that you're going to see in the next sequence. Uh, just fascinating stuff. All right, <clears throat> first is to prepare the environment. Make the area foal safe. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, I've seen foals slip out underneath a stall door that had a, you know, one foot, foot and a half gap below it. Uh, so the mare went down and, and the foal actually slipped out underneath into the aisleway. And that was, um, could have caused a major problem. Uh, remove all sorts of junk and sharp nails, anything that doesn't look safe and smooth because these foals, when they get up, they're bouncing around and they're supposed to be out in a field, not confined in a box stall. So if you're having your mare foal inside, you have to make sure that everything's nice and clean and um, also uh, make sure that the bedding is cl clear. A lot of people discuss the types of bedding that's used and I like personally like straw uh, because straw is like pampers. As the urine comes out and all the fecal, I mean the uh, maternal water breaks, um, this has a chance to go down through the straw into the uh, sawdust or shavings below or the ground below it. And the straw can stay relatively warm and dry up next to the foal, especially if you're in the wintertime. <clears throat> Once the foal is born, never turn the foal out next to another horse without a double fence between the two. I've literally seen foals kicked in the head and killed by the horse next door as the two mares fight. And the good chance it was its own mother that kicked the head because somebody wasn't paying attention. And O is remove all shoes <clears throat> from the mare. If the mare has to have shoes up front, well, so be it. But it is much better to have no uh, shoes on the horse's feet because the steel plates on the bottom of the hooves can break legs of the foal. And preparing the mare, <clears throat> if you vaccinate mares for common local diseases 30 days before they're due, that immunity will pass through the mother's milk called the colostrum and go into the foal. So if you're going to vaccinate the mare for tetanus or rabies or encephalitis or any other diseases that you find common in your area, do that 30 days before the uh, foal is due to um, deliver, and you won't have to vaccinate the foal at birth. Although some veterinarians still vaccinate the, the foal for tetanus at birth, and that's between you and your veterinarian. I already said, remove all shoes, especially the hind shoes, and have the mare in the barn where she's foaling for 30 days before, because there's local allergens that the immune system will build itself up for, and will be passed in the first milk, the colostrum. Um, and, and having the mare there is really helpful. Don't move the mare a day or two before she's going to fold to another farm. It just isn't, you know, that just doesn't make sense in so many reasons. If she's dripping or streaming milk, collect it and freeze it and label it with the date collected. Put it in the freezer and keep it there. And that, that way, when the foal is born, you can thaw it out. And I don't mean thaw it by sticking in the microwave. I mean thaw it by just leaving it on the kitchen counter at room temperature and let it come to uh, liquid again. And then feed the, the, the foal that colostrum. And it's funny, I, I forgot to use the word colostrum here. But colostrum is the milk that's uh, made by the mare uh, within the first couple of days of delivery. And the foal's abdomen has the ability to absorb these uh, proteins. And then after 24 hours, the foal's gut can no longer absorb this colostrum. If it doesn't get the colostrum, 
it doesn't have a transfer of immunity from the mare to the foal, and the foal is susceptible to becoming uh, diseased. And this is one of the basic problems with foals getting sick after birth, that they didn't get their mother's colostrum. <clears throat> and while you're at it, keep the mare's vulva and udder clean. Just good soap and water, good hygiene, so when she does deliver, you aren't working through crud um, and debris. Things to have on hand. Cell phone is number one with your vet's number in it, as well as some competent hands to call for help. So if you think you're going to need some help and you want your husband or your wife to come out there or your best friend, <clears throat> make sure their number's in there and call them <clears throat> as well as your veterinarian and say, I'm going to be staying up and watching this mare deliver her foal. And I wanted to make sure that you were in town and you were available and you wouldn't mind me calling you at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning if I need help. Put these people on alert that you might be calling. It really makes a difference. Have some soap and warm water with clean towels available because uh, folding and delivering folds can be a mess. And for me personally, when I get fetal fluids on my hands and my arms about, oh, I don't know, an hour or so later, my arms raise in bumps and they itch like crazy. And the, the number one cure is to wash all that fetal fluid off by thorough washing for me. Uh, make sure you have some flashlights, strong flashlights so you can see things because mares always full at night. They rarely full in the afternoon, although I've seen it happen, but most of them full between um, midnight and five o'clock in the morning. You should have a pair of scissors on hand. You can get them with sharp points, or you can get them with dull points like bandage scissors, but make sure they're sharp, and I'll tell you why later on in this presentation, but a uh, pair of scissors is really important. You can get away with a sharp knife and using your fingers, but whenever you stab um, uh, these membranes that are in the mare, uh, there's a chance that you could poke the foal underneath it, and that's why I recommend scissors. You have to have patience. And you have to trust the process. If you've never seen a mare deliver a foal, you could be freaking out as it happens. And I was able to attend many foalings with uh, new time owners. And I spent most of my time calming people down, saying, oh, no, that's normal. Oh, no, that's normal. <laughs> so knowledge to know when to step in and when to leave alone and when to call for help is what I'm going to try and get across to you. There are times when you have to step in and you don't have time to call the vet. There's times when you need to call for help. And then there's times just to stay the heck out of the stall and enjoy this beautiful and natural process. <clears throat> so let's go with when not to step in. That's pretty much all the time. Most people interfere with something that is really between the mare and the foal. I cannot understand where, why somewhere somebody said you need to get in there and rub the foal dry with a towel. Yes, I know it's below freezing outside or even zero um, degrees Fahrenheit or minus 12, or whatever it is in Celsius. Uh, but if you're out of the wind, let the mare take care of this foal. Now, there are some mares that reject foals, and that's a whole nother subject. And then you do have to step in. But the rule of thumb is the delivery process is usually quick and progresses. And that word progression is the most important thing. From going down to full deliveries between 20 minutes and an hour, the key is that it progresses and does not stall. That's the most important signal. Now, sometimes you sit there and say, is it stalling or is it progressing? And you sit there and you worry and you worry. But keep your clock on hand. And maybe I didn't put that in the slide there along with a cell phone because cell phones usually have clocks built in. But <clears throat> have some sort of clock on the wall if you need it and mark the time she starts to go down, start straining. So let's take a look at this, <clears throat> this donkey mare. Uh, she'll get up and down several times to reposition the foal. And the time of this shot... Um, is 9, uh, 9, uh, um, 9 24 p.m. And I'm going to keep that clock going here so you can see the progression of events. Because at 14 minutes, this mare has gotten down on her left side and she's turning and looking. It looks like colic because it is. It's basically pain in the abdomen, which is this full positioning self and trying to get up. And here we are at 9 38, which is 14 minutes into the game. Then now the mare is standing back up. It's 9.46 at 22 minutes. And then look here. 
the mare is down on her right side and we're at 9.57 or 33 minutes. So for over a half hour, this mare has been getting up and down, up and down, knowing that it's coming. And you should be alert and aware. Now, I gotta tell you, there are times where the mare will be sitting there just eating hay and looking at you. And then you have to go to the bathroom and you run out to the house and you run back and the foal has been delivered. I'm serious. This is normally an explosive event from the time where the mare is sitting there chewing hay to the time she's pushing the foal out can be as little as five to ten minutes. It's an explosive event and that's important because there are predators out there and they need to get that foal out and up on its feet as fast as possible to, to uh, encourage its survival. And if the mare is just messing around and going up and down like this she's making a lot of noise she's attracting predators and all sorts of things so 33 minutes for mayor to be going up and down is relatively long and now i'd be starting to wonder is this a problem <clears throat> but at 35 minutes you can see that the water is broken now although you can't see it here you see the liquid on the ground and you can see that the foal is trying to come out of the vulva of the birth canal. Uh, you can also see that sometimes you'll see uh, feces come out of the anus at this point um, as it's pushed out. And you can also see the mare's udder, which is filled with her nipples, filled as well. She's been showing all the signs of uh, impending parturition, as we call it. So here the mare is on her left side, and at 35 minutes, and here at 48 minutes, the mare is on her right side. So she got up again and repositioned herself. Um, but we we're very patient and just waited because the mare was progressing and wasn't going into more pain, more agony without um, purposeful contractions. So here's the normal delivery. There are two hooves, one slightly ahead of the other, and the foal's nose. Now this is really common that the legs are on one side. Don't freak out. I always show people that you have two legs coming out with nose in between, but this position is very normal where the foal's head is just off to one side of where the foal's uh, limbs are. This is at 48 minutes. I want you to know that this is what I call the pale blue covering or what's called, um, well, this is the normal uh, uh, fetal membranes that you should be seeing. If at this point you don't see this or if you see a bright red uh, sac coming out, that is a red sac delivery and that's an emergency and I'm going to tell you about that in a little bit. But I want to keep walking you through what a normal foaling process is. There's another thing I want you to notice. Look at these hooves. The hooves are facing down. If you see the bottom of the hoof is facing toward where the, the mare's hooves are. That's what I call facing down. If the hoofs were facing up at this point, you would not be seeing a nose, but you'd be seeing the hind legs being delivered. So the hind legs would be coming out first, and we don't want that. Remember, if the hind legs are coming out first, the, the sole of those hind feet would be facing up or backwards, not down toward the ground. Think about that for a second um, as you just envision hind legs coming out. In other words, if you're standing, if you're standing right now, or even if you're sitting, and raise your hands up in the air uh, with your palms facing ahead in the same direction that you're looking, now curve your feet down and look where the bottoms of your feet are. They're facing the opposite direction. That's what I mean by hooves facing down or hooves facing up. If they're facing down, it's the front limbs coming out. If they're facing up, it's the hind limbs coming out. All right, here we are at 61 minutes. So we're at a full hour, and this mare has delivered her foal and it's on the ground. You notice that the blue sack is still around um, the hind end of the horse, but it's not around the, the nose. And that's important because if it's still around the nose, this, mare, this foal is trying to breathe on its own. And sometimes it can't because... It basically has uh, tissue covering its front. So if you have to at this point, you can run in and lift the blue sack off the nose. But the reason you didn't do it at the very beginning is because the foal was still connected to the mare through the umbilical cord. It was getting the mare's blood uh, pumped through into it. So 
it was being delivered oxygen to. So the horse is okay. But as soon as the horse gets to this position where it's pulled out, then the mare is, may or may not be able to get blood to this foal. And the foal needs to be breathing on its own. And so it needs to have a clear access. So if you have to step in and pull the membranes off the nose, get in, do it, and get out and watch the rest of this process. Because what I want you to notice is, look at the position of the foal. The foal is curved toward the mother's head. I'm going to show you in this next picture. Do you see how the foal has come out of the mare? Its hind legs are still inside of it, yet it's curving its body to the right to go right toward the mare's head. This is so cool because as you see in this next picture, you see how she's going to start to struggle and move toward the mare. Now the mare doesn't have to get up right now. She could be exhausted, but as the foal struggles and moves forward over her hind legs, which actually gives the foal a little bit of traction, you'll see that the, um, the, mo the foal's nose can reach the mare's nose and the connection starts. And that's the beautiful bond that if you're in there interfering with it, it is a major problem. You must let the mare and the foal bond or you could have some behavioral issues that you'll see within 24 hours. So let the foal struggle, let it work towards the mare's uh, nose, and don't worry about the umbilical cord right now. It usually won't tear apart until either the mare or the foal stands. And as you can see here, as the foal continues to struggle, <laughs> it's so funny because the foal is, is completely twisted around, its hind legs are actually facing you now. And you can see the tension on the umbilical cord. And this is where the, the, the cord is going to break. So um, if the cord doesn't break, if the foal comes out and the cord is still attached, uh, there is a way to take care of this. And what you need to do is place your hand on the, on the belly of the foal where the umbilical cord is coming out and have the umbilical cord come out between your middle and index fingers. So you're going to take your, the palm of your hand with all your fingers and lay it flat on the foal's belly with the umbilical cord coming straight out between your middle and your, and your uh, index finger. And with your other hand, you can wrap your hand, the umbilical cord around your other hand and, and, and then simply just pull. This is a normal process. Never, ever, ever cut the umbilical cord using scissors or knife. You will hemorrhage the foal and the foal can bleed out. So don't do that. You want the tension of pulling that snaps the arteries so it prevents it from bleeding out. It is a natural process. And in some cases, the, the placenta, which is the birth uh, uh, fetal tissues, will come out of the mare too soon and will not have the tension to pull it away from the foal. And you have to step in by placing your hand on the belly, your fingers spread apart with the umbilical cord coming through, and then you wrap the cord around with your other hand and you pull and pull and pull until it snaps. All right, that's, that's how I do it. And that's the way it should be done because that's the way nature does it. So here the foal is separated from the mare. The umbilical has completely come out. It's hard to see, but the soles of the feet look really uh, stringy and very soft. This is normal. I have countless number of new time clients who look at foals like this and say, oh my gosh, look at the bottom of the feet. They're, 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 they're deformed. They're defective. That's not true. Within, I don't know, an hour or less, they will look like a normal hoof. They've just been soaking in water for 11 months. And as soon as they dry out, you'll see a beautiful hoof form. Right now, the time is one hour and 14 minutes and the foal is completely out of the mare and completely detached. Again, still on the don't step in stage, um, the mare is going to go up there and explore the foal. She's going to use her lips, her tongue, and sometimes her teeth. And one of the most favorite things mares do is they come up to the foal's ears and they suck them. They actually take them inside the mouth and they suck them. And it is normal and sometimes they'll actually bite Sometimes they'll take their foot and occasionally poke it. Trust the process. It is rare that the mare will savage the foal and kill it in front of your eyes. It is very rare. Um, these mares usually know what they're doing. I don't know how they know, but they do. 
and they will be licking and, and, and nipping and poking and doing all sorts of things. Stay out of the stall. Enjoy the process. Log it into your memory banks. This is a beautiful, beautiful event. Here the foal is going to try to stand, and we're at one hour and 16 minutes from the time the mare went down to start pushing. This is one hour and 16 minutes, and this is one hour and 19 minutes. That's one hour and 19 minutes from the time the mare went down to deliver a foal to the foal standing up. This is incredible. I just, uh, er, as I'm talking to you right now, I still am in disbelief that this can possibly happen. But that's, that's how it's done. So the foal is going to be ready to run by morning time. So when the sun comes up, by certainly the next night, that mare and foal can be traveling and moving on, which is what mares and foals do. So this is when your help is necessary. There are a couple of situations when there's no time to get help. I want to give you a rule of thumb. 90%, which means 90 out of 100 deliveries, go without any complications. The chance of your mare delivering a foal with no complications is very, very good. This is why so many people opt just to go, into, go out in the morning and see if the mare delivered her foal. That's foolery. Because if you've invested time and money I wouldn't be sitting around inside sleeping. I'd be out there ready to be on, on call to make sure that I was there to attend. Because of the remaining 10 of them, 9 of them will have a minor problem. They will have some sort of uh, delivery problem. They'll get stuck. The mare will just need some assistance. The umbilical may not come off. Something will happen. But 1 in 100 will have a major and possibly life-threatening problem. And I've been there, I've seen them, and I know I've seen foals die, I've seen mares die, and it's possible. As a veterinarian, th those are the ones we do see, but they are, thankfully, very rare. So, if the foal is delivered and is trying to breathe but has a pale blue sack covering the nostrils, step in and pull the pale blue sack off and then get, get out of there. That's one time where you need to get in. If there's a dark red sack coming out of the mare instead of the pale blue one, I call that a red sack delivery. You need to enter the stall carefully. Pardon me. <laughs> you need to enter the stall and carefully cut the red sack with a pair of scissors. Um, if you take um, a sharp knife, you must be very careful when you puncture. When you do puncture this red sack, uh, all the water is going to escape. It's just going to pour out on top of you if, if you're not standing off to the side. But all you have to do is make a small incision and then stick your fingers in and tear it just like a fold coming out. Just take your fingers, the index finger, each hand in the cut hole and tear it widely apart and then leave the stall. All right. A red sack delivery is an explosion of the fold along with the placenta. The fold can suffocate and die if you don't open the red sack. If you're too slow, then the foal may not get enough oxygen because at this point, the foal is still dependent on the mother's blood through the umbilical cord to breathe. After creating the hole in the red sac, leave the stall and allow for the normal birthing. So here's a, um, a three minute, 11 second uh, video of, uh, that I put together. I'm gonna uh, play for you. I'm Dr. Jeff Tucker. This video is gonna talk about red sac delivery or what we also know as premature separation of the placenta. This is a diagram of a foal sitting inside the womb or the uterus, and this is the birth canal. What I want to show you is this little attachment here called the umbilicus has blood, and that blood comes from the lining that goes all the way around here, and it's directly attached and it collects the blood for mom, and it goes through here and through little vessels, and eventually in here, and then of course out. And this sac is the red sac. Inside that red sac is another blue sac. It's kind of like tissue paper in a, in a box. It just provides a little bit more protection. Now this blue sac, it's thin, it's translucent, and upon delivery, the water breaks like that, and this blue sac comes out, and this is what you see. That's normal. But in a red sac delivery, what happens is this red sac doesn't break, 
and you see the red sack. Now, sorry for you guys, this is actually orange, but that's okay. When you see the red sack, you've got an emergency. And what's happening is this connection here is starting to come apart. And as the mare squeezes, this foal is coming out and it's taking the whole package out and it's going to be dropped in the stall as a sack with a dead foal inside of it. All right? Worst case scenario is as it comes out, halfway out, it finally breaks through, breaks the sack, and it, and it comes out as a dummy. A dummy means that the horse or the foal didn't get enough oxygen because all the oxygen was cut off. It's like holding your nose, not getting enough oxygen, and you can kind of get brain damage. All right? So what you need to do, and you have to do this before calling a vet. You do not have time. This is a matter of seconds. If you see a red sack delivery, you take a pair of sharp scissors or a knife and you cut this. And when you cut it, the fluids in here will come gushing out. It's called breaking water. All right? And if you get it all over you, you're a rookie. So stand to the side and let it all come out. And this foal's blue sack will come through and the delivery will occur rapidly. This is one of the few times where I actually intervene and pull the foal out and get his nostrils exposed to air to get him getting air as quickly as possible. Because when you see red sack, you have to assume that you've got a break in the lining here and the foal is actually getting anoxic or lack of oxygen. All right, red sack, emergency, no time to call a vet. This is why you must attend your foalings uh, to prevent this because this one simple act has saved your foal's life and, and you're going to be uh, really happy that you knew about this. All right? All right, that video is also on the website, so if you want to see it again, it's there. Um, here's the, uh, the third uh, reason to come in. Uh, if two hooves are facing down along with a nose, uh, that's normal and progression is fine. But if there's no progression, or if you notice that one hoof is much further out than the other, um, then you may have something that I call elbow lock. So uh, elbow lock is probably the most common dystocia, and dystocia is a fancy word for difficult birth that you'll come across. So again, this is a normal delivery. Here if you have two front feet coming out um, early in the process. There's no nose at this point. And then you have the mare delivering two feet and a nose. Interestingly, for those who, of you who are paying attention, notice that the previous slide, she was on her uh, right side. Here she's on her left side. And then if you realize when she finally delivers the foal, she's on her right side. Again, reiterating that the mare will get up and down even with the foal hanging out of her. That's normal, so don't worry about it. But if you have one leg, one hoof that's much further out than the other and there's no progression as the mare keeps struggling and pushing and the fold doesn't keep coming out then you may have elbow lock so I want to explain what elbow lock is um, in the next video but it's basically a cork in the bottle so let's watch this video hi I'm Dr. Jeff Tucker I'd like to show you in this video one of the simple remedies for a blocked fold in birth about 90% or 90 out of 100 mares to deliver a foal, no problem. One mare out of 100 will be a disaster, where hopefully with good veterinary care, you'll be able to get that foal out. There's nine in there that kind of get stuck for one reason or another, and you probably are able to get those things out on your own because you don't have time to get the veterinarian out there. One of them is called elbow lock. Now, elbow lock sounds pretty simple, uh, and it is. If, if this is the shoulder blade, okay, and then this is the, the upper arm, and this is the forearm, and then the, the digits and the hoof down here. When a foal is delivered, this is the way it looks. The leg is straight out like that. But in a foal with elbow lock, this now looks like this. And when it's locked up like that, the birth canal it gets jammed. It can't get through. It's stuck. When a foal is normally delivered, it comes out with a nose and two front feet looking out with hooves facing down. If it has elbow lock, you'll be able to tell because the nose and one foot is right here and the other foot's out here someplace. All right? When that happens, it's very easy to take care of. And again, you can have this done in like 10 seconds flat and you can do it by yourself 
You can do it um, no matter what size or shape you're in. You basically take your hand and put it on the horse's forehead, on the foal's forehead, and push the foal back. Right? In the meantime, take your other hand and pull this out. And you see how that works? You're sitting like this, and you push the head back, and you pull it out. Two steps. Push the head back, pull the limb out, and everything comes out. And you've got that extension in here, and the foal can be delivered. Simple. Ten seconds, you've got your horse, uh, your foal delivered, and uh, everyone lives happily ever after. Okay? That's elbow lock. I got more tips for you. Okay. <clears throat> so when do you need to call for help? Again, that video is on the Horses Advocate if you want to uh, become a member. Um, anyway, um, just sign up and you'll, and you'll see all that stuff. Uh, when you see a hoof facing up, this is a rear hoof presentation. I went over this earlier uh, in, the, in this webinar. Um, and sometimes you need your vet's help and experience. Uh, but these foals get delivered easily and can be delivered by yourself uh, if you know what you're doing. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, go get some help <clears throat> or maybe have some talk you through it. But basically, you need to put traction by uh, grabbing onto the hind legs and, and helping the mare expel the foal because <clears throat> the foal is coming out hip first. And that's like the largest part of the foal. And as she strains and pushes, the foal may get stuck and you have to actually rotate the foal uh, 90 degrees to one side or the other like a a twisting motion and pull the fold down toward the mare's hocks and you might be able to help her come out with that but that would be a good time to call somebody to get some help. When you see nothing, just a nose, just two hooves, two hooves without a nose, three or more hooves with or without a head or if you only see a tail. These are all the complications. In other words, if the head is turned back and facing along the side of the fold, it's never going to come out. All you're going to see is two hooves. If you see um, uh, three or more hooves, it could have a hind leg coming out, or it could be twins coming back or coming out together. Or if you only have a tail, that's called a breech birth, and no legs are coming out. These are serious complications, and you need help as fast as possible and call your veterinarian uh, who's experienced in delivering complex dystocias. So uh, it can be life-threatening for the mare. And the, and the foal. Um, when you see something that should not be there or the progression of delivery stops and the mare is in trouble, that's your rule of thumb. So there could be a number of reasons, including uterine rupture or rectal tears. I've seen a mare that delivered her foal and the mare was not doing well. And I got called out <clears throat> and I lifted the tail and there was the mare's uterus and her intestines on the ground. So yeah, th these things can be disasters. But again, 90 out of 100 go without a hitch. The other 9 out of 100 have those things like such as elbow lock or something very simple or red sack delivery. Uh, but the 1 in 100, and it might be even um, less than 1 in 100, are disasters. And you have to be aware of that. Have your phone and your prep kit ready and call your vet as soon as possible. <clears throat> so in the first 24 hours, some of the normal things is the foal stands and nurses on their own, just like this um, mare is nursing the foal. Um, and this obviously is a little bit older than one day old, but um, the foal uh, will run and play and will sleep a lot, and that's normal. <clears throat> In the next picture, I want you to notice the posture and position of the mare and foal. This is a classic scene of a foal nursing um, 10 and a half hours after the mare stand, uh, went down to deliver the foal. Let me just show you here. Uh, notice that the uh, off hind, or the near hind leg, her left hind leg, is slightly cocked and, and resting on the toe. This is how a mare presents the udder to the fold. This is absolutely normal, and it's kind of cool to see her tipping the, the udder toward the fold. And notice how the fold has to reach down to get that. The line that goes from the fold's mouth straight along its backbone is level. This is important, especially if you ever, ever, ever have to hand nurse a foal with a bottle. Never put the head up above the lungs because when you do, if this horse accidentally inhales some of the milk, it will put it into the lungs and kill the foal. And it was a very sad day on a farm where uh, this, this couple 
had twins and they decided to hand milk by holding the foal like a baby in their arms upside down and nursing it and just filled the lungs with, with uh, milk and killed it. This foal's head is supposed to be down. This is normal. Uh, and sometimes it takes a while for the foal to figure out where the udder is, but somehow they find it. Some people think that they're looking for a very dark spot in, in light. They, they aim for a dark spot. I don't think anybody has the actual reasons why, but it's, it's pretty cool when you see it. And it's a process, again, that you don't need to interfere with. Trust the process. The foal will find it. But if it doesn't, and you're at 12 to 18 hours, it's time to get in there and help hold of the mare and get the foal in the right position. And stick your thumb in the foal's mouth. And if the, and if the foal starts sucking on your thumb, that's great. Because if he doesn't have a good suck reflex, that's a problem. <clears throat> your vet may have some specific recommendations for the medical exam and tests that they recommend in your area. However, there's one thing I highly recommend, no matter who you are or where you live in the world, and that is to have some iodine on hand and dip the umbilicus with the iodine. This prevents an ascending infection from a dirty environment that can cause an internal abscess that can be life-threatening. <clears throat> yeah, I think not dipping the stump is inexcusable and is foolish, but that's just the way I feel. Here's an umbilical of a newborn foal. You can see it's got uh, debris on it and it's got a little bit of moisture. And sometimes these things don't close up right. And it's a source where um, bacteria from the environment can actually travel up the umbilical cord. By dipping in iodine, not only kills the bacteria, but it also cauterizes this thing and, and helps keep things really, really uh, clean and in, in the full healthy. There's nothing worse than having an abscess inside the abdomen. Okay, this is how you do it. I've seen it done a million ways, but this is the only way. Take a cup. It could be a plastic or paper. Um, it doesn't have to be huge. And you fill it halfway up with iodine. You don't want to have it full, but you don't want too little. You just want to have enough. And with the full standing, arch over the top of the full so you're standing on one side of the full and your arms are on the other side. All right, this position keeps the staining iodine off your clothes. I'm telling you, have yourself on one side of the full and your arms on the other side. Okay, now place the cups opening over the stump and let it slosh about covering the area completely. So in other words, you're gonna seal the top of the cup around the abdomen of the foal with the umbilicus stuck inside the cup. And as the foal jumps around and sloshes around, it's gonna be very thoroughly covered with iodine. And then after the foal stops moving and everyone's calm and quiet, then remove the cup. And I guarantee you won't get iodine all over your fingers and your clothes. So let's look at some of the take-home points. For mares, the mares reproductive cycle is basically six days in heat and 15 days out of heat for a total of 21 days. Mares cycle to produce foals when they are, there's abundant foods, they're seasonal. Record all observations to get a clear picture of your mares cycle and keep your mare lean for best results. Take home points for this beautiful foal. Isn't he gorgeous? That's the same one you guys saw delivered. Isn't he amazing? And this is like not even a day old. Prepare for the delivery. <clears throat> know what normal is. Don't interfere with a beautiful event. Jump in for things you can't wait for help. Call for help when there are things that you can't do anything about. And be sure to dip the foal's navel in iodine. All right, well, that's it. Uh, this is one of the books I have for sale. Yes, I'm shamelessly advertising some of the things I've got, The Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship. Everybody who owns a horse should own this, study it, and understand how it is or how they take care of horses. This is just so important. Uh, the Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship. I also have two other books that you can go to theequinepractice.com to get. And I also will shamelessly, shamelessly tell you about equinedentistry.com pardon me, horsemanshipdentistry.com, which is our style of uh, horsemanship uh, approach to dentistry where we don't use drugs automatically and we don't jack the mouth open or suspend the head. Uh, this is something that's really cool and you guys should all check out. And also the Horses Advocate. Uh, the Horses Advocate is helping horses thrive in a human world uh, by informing you with simple and simplistic uh, basic concepts of horse husbandry. 
So now, if you have any questions at all, I'd love for you to ask them, and I will try and answer them all, and um, and uh, make sure everybody's uh, all set. We're just at about an hour here, uh, so hopefully um, you've got a lot of questions, and that's what's going to be the rest of this um, webinar. So thank you for your time in becoming your horse's advocate, and this is Doc T.